Welcome to Dateline Schools, a presentation of the St. Clair County Regional Educational Service Agency with your host, Terry Harrington. Welcome to Dateline Schools. We have a very interesting program in store for you. First, we're going to start with Dr. Annette Mercantant, the director of the St. Clair County Health Department. She's going to give us some tips on how to get this school year off to a healthy start. And then we're going to hear a mother's story on how immunizations could have prevented a family tragedy. But before we begin, let's turn into this education update with the Vet Plaché. Thank you, Terry. As everyone gets back to the classroom this month, students and teachers in all seven local school districts are using a new writing curriculum. The Write Well curriculum, developed by RISA consultants Jeff Beal and Victoria Less in conjunction with area educators, was implemented in a limited capacity last year. This semester marks the first time it will be used countywide. Write Well, designed to improve both the writing skills of students and how instructors teach writing, is aligned with all of Michigan's grade level content expectations. Les said having a common curriculum in all schools and all grades will be beneficial to local students. Several local students extended their learning this past summer when they took part in Tech's robot camps. The five-day camps held in July were available to students in grades six through eight. Participants learned to build Lego NXT robots at both the beginner and advanced levels. The daily activities provided them with instruction on topics including programming behaviors, systems control, sensors, and feedback. In addition to gaining knowledge on robots, students got a valuable lesson in teamwork. They worked in teams of two to decide what they wanted the robot to do and then figure out how to build and program it. Students got a chance to show off their hard work when their parents attended a demonstration on the last day of camp. In October, students statewide in grades 3 through 9 will once again take the annual MEEP test. MEEP stands for Michigan Educational Assessment Program, and it is the central measurement of student progress in those grades. Students in grades 3 through 8 will be tested in English Language Arts and Mathematics. Students in grades 5 and 8 also will be tested in Science. A Social Studies test will be given to 6th and 9th graders. Students wishing to get a jump start on the test can go to the Michigan Department of Education's website where they can download MEEP tests from the last eight years to use as practice. And finally, everyone should mark the date of September 29th on their calendars. That's the day the state will officially count students attending school districts. That day's count determines each district's budget allocation from the state, so it is very important that all students show up. Absences could cut into the amount of money the state sends to the district. I hope you're enjoying the school year so far. I'm Yvette Pache. Terry Harrington and Dateline Schools will return in a moment. Welcome back to Dateline Schools and on this segment we're going to give you some healthy tips to get this brand new school year off to a healthy start. And with all the information, special guest is the director of the St. Clair County Health Department, Dr. Annette Mercantant. Dr. Mercantant, welcome back. Thank you, Terry. It's good to have you here and, and uh, we always enjoy your time together. But now that we're getting the school year off to a, the start, what can we be doing as parents to, to help our kids get some good healthy habits, you know, not only just for school aged years, but you know, for later on in life too? Key issues with children is they need the rest and they need a good balanced diet. So we always tell our kids don't skip meals, limit your pop and fast foods and stay away from the junk food. And when you say don't skip meals, breakfast is probably breakfast one of those to make sure they don't skip One meals. of the most important, when you think about when you fall asleep at night, it's the longest period of time that your body goes without nutrition. When you wake up, it's really important to break that fast, which is what break breakfast means. You're breaking your fast. It's very important. Okay. Now, um, how important is good nutrition and good healthy habits um, to educational success for our kids? There's no question. You can tie in good learning skills and the ability to learn with uh, a healthy body and mind. Um, we know that kids don't get, who don't get their sleep and are hungry really don't perform as well. What can parents be doing now, you know, now that school started, but what can they be doing now to ensure that their kids have good healthy habits? I'd start them on their schedule. <laughs> if they've been staying up till 1, 2 o'clock in the morning watching TV, start backing that schedule back down and getting them back on a routine. In a schedule and likewise for the for the meals you know summertime everything gets changed so make sure they're waking up in the morning having something to eat eating again at lunchtime that will reflect what they're going to do once they go back to school how about with the hygiene and some of those things hygiene 
Yeah, washing their hands and some of those kind of habits. <laughs> well, that, I hope, isn't something you just do in school. No. That's something that everyone should be doing all the time. You always should wash your hands anytime you go to the bathroom and, of course, before you eat. And especially when you come home from school or on the bus or whatever, that's probably important to make sure to do, too. Before you <laughs> use your hands to go near your mouth, they should be washed. Okay. One of the other things that's been in the news a lot this summer nationally is child obesity. Mm -hmm. How are we doing here in St. Clair County? Probably not very well. We have a higher obesity rate we know in adults than the um, state average. And when you combine overweight and obese individuals, it's over 60%. Children, uh, the data for children is not as available. We suspect that it's probably in the same ballpark because we know that children's habits tend to mimic the adults. Yeah, is there any effort on the way in the county to try to educate our population about childhood? childhood I think disease? education is going to be the key and we have uh, recently developed a work group that uh, will hopefully coordinate all the individual efforts that are being um, implemented, uh, both education, schools, uh, the various um, uh, organizations and uh, we have um, several other groups, the YMCA for instance, that are all sitting now together talking about how we can work together to make this uh, happen in our community. And my guess is too, even though we're into the fall season, weather's going to start getting colder and day is getting shorter, get off the bus, still get the kids outside and play and Act have some fun. Right? Activity is a big piece of it. One of the theories behind the increasing rate of obesity, you know, we're calling this an obesity epidemic mm -hmm. because it's rising so drastically. But one of the theories is that we just don't do as much. We do. We come home and we sit in front of the television set and the computer and the video games and we don't move. Now, one thing you also mentioned too, you know, watch your snacks and, you know, don't eat a lot of fast foods and that, mm -hmm. but what can mom be doing to help make sure those kids get a good nutritious lunch, not just the Hostess Twinkies and some of those kind of things? Well, a lot of it depends on what you do at home. If mm -hmm. the healthy foods are there and the unhealthy snacks are not, children will eat what's available to them. Mm -hmm. Eventually, it may take some getting used to. It's a, it's a matter of getting used to a new system. We talk about five fruits or vegetables a day, and if you have the majority of your snacks and foods and that those two food groups, fruits and vegetables, you'll go a long way towards reaching those goals. Okay. Now last year at this time when I had you on the program, we were really concerned and talking a lot about H1N1. Yes, we were. We haven't heard anything this summer. What, what's up with that? We've been blessed with a very, very quiet summer. Um, the H1N1 virus does not seem to be causing a lot of illness anywhere in the world right now. We're having small, very small, sporadic, um, uh, detections of this virus throughout the country, but so far uh, it does not look like it's reemerged. Any idea why the sudden change? Viruses are an enigma. <laughs> um, they they circulate and then they get transformed. And and what we have anticipated this fall is to include the H1N1 uh, antigen or virus uh, protein in the vaccine for the flu vaccine this year. So the flu vaccine will include the H1N1 in addition to two of the other viruses we suspect will circulate. Mm -hmm. And are those vaccines available now? Or they're they're coming in now. Okay. They're coming in now. We uh, are just now getting our first shipments in. So they should be available um, later this month for sure. Okay, great. Another area of concern um, for parents and for, for school workers especially is immunizations. And aren't there some new rules this year uh, for kids coming in? Yes, there are. Uh, we want to make sure that all new kindergarten students, and certainly our focus is on the uh, sixth graders entering into middle school, uh, we want to make sure they have uh, two chickenpox vaccines. So one as a baby and a booster shot. We want to make sure they're vaccinated against meningitis, and we want to make sure they get a tetanus slash pertussis booster. Now the meningitis, that's new for school kids, isn't it? It's a new requirement. The vaccine has been available for quite some time. Okay. Now are those available through the health department or the local doctors? Yes, <laughs> both. Um, I should make a plug that um, in order to prepare our students for um, school this year, we are offering at the health department a uh, open house uh, vaccine clinic day on Saturday, August 28th. And that will be at the main health department on 28th and Moak. 
and that's primarily focused on getting all those sixth graders vaccinated, but anyone is welcome mm -hmm. for any vaccines that they might need. Now, what happens if uh, school secretary or whoever checks the immunization records mm -hmm. finds out that Johnny doesn't have that second booster, what, what happens then? They should contact their health provider or they okay. should call us and we'll make sure they get caught up. And now the school's not gonna prevent them from going, are they? Or what, what's the rules on that? It's, um... I think they would require proof of immunization mm -hmm. or uh, they would be uh, withheld from school. Okay. Now, the, you guys keep a, a record of all that for the kids, don't they? So if mom says, hey, I can't find my son's immunization records, what do they do? There is a, there is a statewide registration. Oh, okay. And uh, ideally, every vaccine that's given to an adult or a child is put into this vaccination registry, and it's available anywhere you go in the whole state. So if you get some of your shots from one place, and other shots somewhere else, it will still all be in one place to access. Okay. Now I also know too, you know, we graduate about 2,000 high school students every year in mm -hmm. our county, and they're all on their way out to, for that freshman yeah. year in college. Shouldn't they uh, be uh, immunized too? Uh, well, we've always focused on those college, um, college bound students, primarily with the meningitis vaccine. When we do have outbreaks of meningitis, it frequently occurs in that dorm setting where we have lots of young people living in close proximity. Um, so yes, uh, if you're getting ready to go away to college, you should definitely consult with your healthcare professional mm -hmm. and see what vaccines are, are recommended. What about for us adults? Any boosters or things that we should have? Terry, the one that I have been uh, most focused on lately, and yes, adults do need booster mm -hmm. vaccines, uh, but the most important one, and we all think about our tetanus booster, mm -hmm. and we do have currently a problem with pertussis. We're having increased pertussis outbreaks, and we'll be talking about that more later. But there is a tetanus booster that includes pertussis in it. Mm -hmm. And I want every adult who thinks they may be due for their tetanus booster to get that vaccine instead. It's just the one time. And then we can all protect ourselves and our babies from pertussis as well. Okay, it's a good place to stop for right now. When we come back, we're gonna talk more about the pertussis issue we have, and also get one mother's story, so don't you go away.